As you said, I am Elena G. Levine. I am a professional speaker, a STEM career coach, and the author of two books, Networking for Nerds and Create Your Unicorn Career, which will be out later this year. And speaking of your unicorn career, I am psyched to the max about today's panel because we assembled a group of talented, brilliant scientists who work in science philanthropy. And you may be wondering what that is. We're gonna describe it in a moment. But the idea here is that you are not limited in your career possibilities and potential by certain pathways. You can actually find really exciting, joyful, and truly impactful, passionate, meaningful careers in the space of foundations and giving back, helping to advance science, helping to advance astronomy, astrophysics, and all sorts of areas in the STEM community. So today we're gonna be hearing from these talented folks. They're gonna talk to us a little bit about how to build your unicorn career in science philanthropy. As always, we're gonna be taking your questions, throw them in the chat. We're gonna be providing lots of different resources and links so that you can begin to think about careers in philanthropy. And by the way, speaking of careers in philanthropy, we actually have several jobs. We're gonna be putting links in the chat, Diane, if you could post those in right now, please. These are actual live job advertisements that are available for you to apply for right now. And you're gonna get from me today, a resume template that you can use to apply for those jobs. So we got your back covered. So let's go ahead and get started. I wanna introduce our fabulous panel. Let me start with introducing Dr. Arpit Arroy. She is a program scientist and an astrophysicist with Schmidt Sciences. Welcome, Arpit, I'm so glad you're here. How are you today? Hi, Elena, I'm great. I'm so glad you're here. I'm also really excited to be able to welcome Dr. Gregory Mack. Greg is a science program officer in astrophysics and theoretical physics with the Kavli Foundation. Hi, Greg, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well and very happy to be here. Fantastic. So glad you're here as well. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrew Feig. He is a chemist. He is a senior program director of the Research Corporation for Science Advancement here in Tucson, where I live. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing today? Hi, Elena. Doing great from sunny Tucson. Yay. I'm so glad you're here as well. All right. So what I'd love for you all to do is give us about a one to two minute introduction. We'd like to know, basically, let's start at the top. What, how do you define philanthropy and science philanthropy? Can you tell us a little bit about your foundation that you work for, your portfolio, and what you do for the foundation? Arpita, why don't we start with you, please? Sure. Um, so I'll start by defining what I think of as science philanthropy, and it's going to be a relatively simple definition. I think a good way to see what the space looks like is to look at the website for the Science Philanthropy Association um, and the Alliance, sorry, the Science Philanthropy Alliance. Uh, and they have, uh, you know, 30 members and growing. Um, and not that there are not other people doing science philanthropy, but I think most, most foundations that do it at scale and sort of talk to each other are captured uh, there. Um, at Schmidt Sciences, we, uh, so Schmidt Sciences is very new. It's actually just about uh, a month and 10 days old. Um, we we used to be a different foundation called Schmidt Futures, uh, founded by Eric and Wendy Schmidt. Um, and they decided that they really wanted to focus uh, a lot more effort on science. And so uh, Schmidt Sciences was born. Um, at Schmidt Sciences, we have five pillars of interest, and you can see that on the website, and one of them is what we call the Astrophysics and Space Institute. Um, so I look after kind of the activities of that institute, um, which at the moment uh, are composed of several hardware and software platforms that we're building. Um, so our philosophy at Schmidt Sciences has been not to focus on any particular um, subfield of astrophysics, but to build facilities that many different uh, sciences can use. Um, and I look after the projects as well, but I'm also starting to think about what the future looks like, or what the, the next decade looks like for Schmidt Sciences. So it sounds like it's a lot of nurturing programs, uh, but then also, like you said, looking forward and thinking about how you can leverage the assets, the intellectual assets, the resource assets, even the network assets of Schmidt Sciences to better serve the community. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think so, some of it is, you know, what facilities and data and funding can we bring, but then also are there are there other aspects that are missing, um, like connecting certain groups that, that would have a huge impact. And your portfolio, does it include uh, fellows and awardees? Does it include 
um, infrastructure? What what are you actually helping to fund and advance? So at the moment, we are funding about five projects that are building software, so big uh, groups of tools for uh, LSST, for example, for Ruben and uh, other observatories. And then we're also actually looking at building facilities. So we're, we've been uh, supporting the prototyping of different observatory concepts, um, and we're exploring how we can, we can see those basically to fruition. Um, so at the moment, the astrophysics pillar doesn't have a fellowship, uh, but I think part of the strategy we're thinking about is once we have those resources, can we support the people who work on them as well? I love it. Thank you, Arpita. And, you know, one of the things that I loved about what you said and about what the work that you're doing is it really is emblematic of the idea that when you pursue a career in science philanthropy, you are pursuing a career in science. You are helping science to happen and to advance and to move forward in the future. You really are a part of it. And you're leveraging your background as an astrophysicist to be able to understand what are the unique needs of this community so that you can better serve them. So I'm so happy for your success and happiness in your career. Greg, tell us a little bit, how would you define philanthropy, science philanthropy? Can you tell us about Cavley and what you do and what your portfolio encompasses, please? Sure. <clears throat> so uh, I, I guess I can define philanthropy in terms of how we at the foundation view it in, in the sense of how we function and operate. So the Cavley Foundation is a private foundation that's based in Los Angeles, and it funds research in astrophysics, nanoscience, neuroscience, and theoretical physics. As you mentioned, I'm the science program officer for astrophysics and theoretical physics. And, you know, we were established because Fred Cavley, an, an individual who actually was born in Norway, came over to the U.S., uh, did very well for himself as an entrepreneur, and he decided that he wanted to give back in the way of actually funding scientific research. And so he picked these fields that we actually fund. The, the large, the small, and the complex are kind of the way that he likes to describe that. And so we he passed away in 2010, and so we still are living up to that mission of, of being able to support those areas of science. But we are doing so because of his great generosity, because he left that money to establish the foundation, and we run off of that money that, that he has provided. And so in our method of philanthropy, we're able to take that and use his vision of providing support for those sciences to actually provide money to the scientific community to make advances, especially for the benefit of humanity. So we want to have that coupled as part of as part of the vision, part of the message that we have as well. And so what we what we are doing too for this is that historically, you know, we have 20 Cavalier Institutes across those four different areas. And we we've, we, we uh, have been fostering those relationships and have that growing, but now we're switching into the uh, strategic investment space and doing more project funding under the leadership of Cynthia Friend, um, the, the president who uh, she, I believe she started in 2021 as a new president of the foundation. And so with her vision and her, uh, we are working on um, establishing the ways that we are actually providing more money for project funding as opposed to the institutes, but and we still work very closely with all of those the, the 20 great Cavalier institutes. And so what I do as science program officer for astrophysics is that I help to interact with the institutes that we have. There are six of them for astrophysics and two of them for theoretical physics. And then also to figure out uh, and identify new areas that we might actually want to be doing for project funding within astrophysics and theoretical physics. Having lots of different conversations and getting things going, investigating where what areas we might actually be able to um, have the most impact in. And this is another definition for, for philanthropy in the sense that because we're a private foundation and we can decide based on our different values and our mission statements as to how we want to actually be uh, how we want to actually be involved in the community and figuring out how we want to do these tar this targeted funding, we are able to do things that the federal government not necessarily can can't necessarily do, and but also can do stuff in in uh, in complementary ways with the federal government. So there are different things that we can do to help the community and support them uh, in in a unique way, and also working with the other foundations such as Schmidt Sciences and RCSA. So it sounds like there's a lot of there, there's, I mean, there's definitely protocols, there's definitely processes, of course, according to the policies with internal to the foundation. But it also sounds like you have an innate flexibility to be able to serve the community when new opportunities come up. Would that be fair to say? Absolutely. And because we're a smaller organization, we can actually be very, very nimble 
with this flexibility that if we actually are able to identify some things like, oh, this is something that is an emerging area, it's a really hot topic and, and in, uh, supporting with funding now as opposed to within a couple of years might actually make a big difference, we're able to actually do that. And so then it also sounds just like ARPEDA, you are constantly engaging and networking with the scientific community, particularly with astronomy and astrophysics worldwide. I suspect both of you probably go to science conferences, the AAS meetings, you're going to specialty meetings because you need to know who is doing what and where are those emerging opportunities to really invest and make an impact. Absolutely. It's, it's really important to kind of really see what's happening in the community research-wise, see the hot topics that are out there, keep conversations going with people with the connections that you have in order to actually see what's happening and what's coming up and, and also be very aware of the, the recent big announcements and advances so that you can see like what the big picture is that's happening and then what might be possible to, to help happen later. I love it. It's such, both both of you describe such an exciting and fun career opportunity for scientists. Andrew, I would love to hear from you. Tell us a little bit about the Research Corporation for Science Advancement, what your definition or how you view foundations and philanthropy, particularly in science, and what do you do? What's your portfolio like? Please. Yeah, so let me start with the question about what is science philanthropy, and I think that's providing resources to the community, usually uh, monetary, but not always, uh, in order to better enable them to do their work. And so um, RCSA is actually the oldest basic science funding foundation in the country. We were founded in 1912. Uh, we Our benefactor was Frederick Gardner Cottrell, and he actually donated a patent uh, to RCSA, the patent for the electrostatic precipitator, which was a uh, the first pollution control device for coal-fired power plants. And RCSA built its endowment, its corpus, based on that patent and then serving as the intellectual property office for all of the universities in the United States until the mid-1980s when laws changed allowing universities to have uh, tech transfer offices. So that's where our money came from. Um, and we fund in the basic sciences, in uh, the physical sciences, chemistry, physics, and astronomy. And our programs focus on high-risk, high-reward seed funding to get projects launched and on early career faculties. And so uh, we want to make investment in communities and in generating the connections that faculty need to succeed on the types of projects that uh, are often um, the most impactful today, and that is collaborations. And so uh, we focus very heavily on community building around uh, areas of science that we think need a little infusion of investment. And we do that predominantly in my portfolio through the Scilog program. We also have a second program available to astronomers for phys uh, physics, chemistry, and astronomy faculty. And that's an early career award called the Cottrell Scholars Award that my colleague Sylvia Ronco uh, manages predominantly, but all of us in the office um, participate in. And so it sounds like also you have to be on um, keeping abreast of different opportunities in in your portfolio. Does it cover the Scilog program? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is that just in chemistry? Is it is it across physics, astronomy, and chemistry? What does that focus on, please? It is super broad. So I, I would say my portfolio probably is lar uh, broader than Arpitas and Greg's in that uh, our programming ranges from, and we run, we ran six of these last year. We're running five of them this year, um, molecular basis of cognition, uh, early science with the LSST telescope. Uh, starting tomorrow, we have one on AI and automated laboratories. Uh, we have another one on um, sustainable materials, minerals, and metals, um, a new one that we just announced today that will launch in 25 on um, neurobiology and changing ecosystems. And so uh, we have a portfolio of areas that we are um, spreading resources towards, but all of them involve collaboration among chemists, physicists, and astronomers and adjacent fields and disciplines. But we also do it with um, 
other philanthropic partners. So Cavalry has been a, a partner of ours on several of our initiatives as well. And so, uh, the Allen Foundation, the uh, Heising Simons Foundation, uh, we think that collaboration is good for the fellows, the people who receive awards from us, but we also think it's great for philanthropy as well. It, this is so interesting. I love the idea of collaborating between the foundations because then the impact can be even bigger. Plus also you have multiple eyes and multiple brains scouring the community for these opportunities, these trends, these issues, these pain points, which means that you can be even more active in solving them and be more impactful and, and supportive of these communities. The other thing, Andrew, that struck me about your portfolio and, and the work that RC uh, SA does is the fact that you, because you do basic research, you are funding scientists who may not have as easy a time to get funding for their basic research from the traditional mechanisms, such as federal government and things like that. So you are really investing in the future of humanity's um, vast uh, bank of knowledge by starting at the basic level. Is that sort of what part of what drives you, like the idea that you can be a part of serving the basic sciences when other types of funders or investors may be more inclined to invest in the implied, where there is a direct correlation to an immediate return on that investment. Yeah, so I think that's accurate. And so, you know, the resources that we can provide, we want to magnify by making groups of scientists ready for the funding that might come from more conservative uh, federal agencies, for instance. If you don't have the preliminary results to get an R01 or an NSF grant or a NASA grant, there has to be a mechanism to launch those ideas. When you are a very new assistant professor, you have some startup funds, but beyond that, how do you um, identify ways to start a new project? How do you find the colleagues who are maybe outside of your discipline? And so a big part of what we do is that networking, that bringing together people from outside of your space that you wouldn't meet at a AAS meeting um, or at an ACS meeting or an APS meeting so that um, we curate those communities, bring them together into a room and have a mechanism to get you to start talking so that uh, this leads to new science and new solutions for societal problems. Um I love this. And it also really goes to the point that we're talking about, about how the foundations themselves actually complement other funding mechanisms in society. Here you are helping to fortify the early career scientists so that they can be better equipped and better credentialed in a certain respect to be able to get federal grants and, and so on and so forth. This is super, this is super interesting. We wanted to remind all of you, you are welcome to throw your questions either in the Q&A or in the chat. We're going to be here to answer them. We've talked a little bit about your portfolios and your foundations. Now I want to shift slightly. I want to hear about your careers. How in the heck did you realize that you could get a job in science philanthropy? So Arpita, tell us a little bit about your origin story. How did you learn about this career space and how did you get your job, please? So I actually didn't know very much about this this career space. I knew of philanthropy from being an instrument builder trying to get funding for instruments. Um, and so I was, you know, happily on the academic straight and narrow. I was uh, at Space Telescope commissioning the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and uh, Schmidt Futures at the time reached out on LinkedIn. Um, and so, you know, have a LinkedIn. Uh, other people use it uh, outside astronomy a lot. Um, and honestly, I thought it was spam at first because the, the job description sounded too good to be true. Um, and so I, I ended up reaching out to friends at Heising Simons, who I knew were legitimate uh, astro supporters, um, to ask about Schmidt Futures, but they were like, yes, of course. And turns out Schmidt Futures was already doing a lot of astronomy support. Um, we just like to be kind of quiet about it. Uh, and so I started talking to them purely out of curiosity, not really thinking I would make the switch, but um, I think over months of learning more about the the foundation and the kind of the vision that they had really seemed like a lot of almost like unharnessed potential with the opportunity to like shape that potential. And so uh, I ended up making the switch out of academia. And thank goodness it wasn't spam because here you are <laughs> serving science in a new way. Love that. Greg, how about you? How did you 
figure out that this could be a career path for you? And how did you get your job? Sure. So my switch out of academia happened about 10 or 11 years ago at this point. So I did my PhD at Ohio State. I finished that in 2008. And I was a little bit confused as to what I was going to do. I thought I was going to be you know, trying to become a research professor at that point. But I got a bit more interested in the teaching aspect at that point and was able to get a visiting professorship at Ohio Wesleyan University. Um, I was there for four years as a physics and astronomy uh, visiting professor. And during that time, I, I love what I was doing, but I also was kind of starting to hone in a bit more on, on the, the, the big picture of science and about how science works in the sense of, of policy and management and that and that as, those aspects of things, which I had been interest in, interested in as well as a grad student, but they were coming out more as, as a professor. And that kind of got me thinking about what it is that I wanted to do and how I wanted to make an impact with regard to my astrophysics career. And I came across the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship Program. And those of you in the audience, if you have not heard this program, I highly encourage you to look into it. And to if, if you're thinking about doing this sort of career switch to, to look into applying to that and, and doing that, because that really was a springboard for me uh, from the academic world into the policy management and philanthropic side of science. So I did I was able to uh, get a fellowship through the program and I got an executive branch fellowship that is was actually at the National Science Foundation. I was working in the physics division and I was one of the first. Well, I was the first fellow that the physics division had. So with my astrophysics background, I was working on, in the physics division, also talking with the, the Division of Astronomical Sciences there as well. Um, so, And I was brought on to work on some specific policy aspects, but also got a really close up view of how the National Science Foundation does their grant work. And so I really got that inside picture about what it's like to what it's like to be involved with federal funding and a, and a foundation like that and the connections that they have and started to think about the connections to the broader picture of society. Now, from there, I went to the American Physical Society and worked in grassroots advocacy and lobbying for a totally different picture of that of that sector outside of, of the academic world, but still connected deeply with the physics and, and astronomy communities. Um, and that was ex extremely interesting. And I learned a lot about that different aspect of uh, of the, uh, the the public sector, if you will, for how physics and astronomy fits into that. And I wanted to start getting back into the science. But I felt like a little bit too far away from it in that role. And it just so happened that the National Academy of Sciences, they were looking for an astrophysicist that could help run the Astronomy and Astrophysics Decadal Survey, or Astro 2020, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, I was one of the two main staff people that helped run that entire program, which got, got me another big perspective uh, into how uh, into the big picture of astronomy and astrophysics for the U.S. and also that connected globally. And thinking about when that when that was over and what I wanted to do with my career and, and thinking about all these different aspects, I realized that I could have a different impact and a more direct impact if I looked at the philanthropy space. And I already had some connections and in our instructions and conversations with people leading up to that, especially going back to my days at NSF. And when the Cavalry Foundation had an opening for a science program for astrophysics, I had already known the Cavalry Foundation. Like in my head, I had I had, I had their branding. I had been exposed to them in many different ways, and I was like, I would love to work for them. And I applied for that, and I was luckily able to to be in this position now. Um, and being in this sector, this philanthropic sector, I feel like I have definitely a more direct connection to the science and a more direct way to make an impact than potentially any other position that I had before. And it's interesting. So how many years have you, did you do a postdoc then, or what did you go straight into being a visiting professor after finishing was, the PhD? I had a small stint of, as a lecturer and then went straight to the visiting professorship. So I did not do a postdoc. Okay. So the, the entire, since you finished your PhD, how many years have you been in the working world? Uh, 16. 16 years. And how long have you been now with the Cavalry Foundation? A year and a half. Okay. So it's interesting to see, first and foremost, that you came in from this unique background of the policy. I'm so happy that you were able to enjoy and find out and, and prosper in the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship Program. Uh, we threw those links into the chat for all of you because this is a phenomenal program. People who participate in this go into a diversity of very enjoyable unicorn careers across all different sectors. And you might not have even thought, the audience might not have even thought that pursuing a background, having a background in policy could actually enable them to be successful in philanthropy. So it's great to see that uniqueness that you have and have had in your career and also the progression over the 16 years. Andrew, how about you? How did you find out about philanthropy? How did you find out about the Research Corporation? And how did you get your job? 
So I've known RCSA for a long, long time. Um, I was actually a, a control scholar in 2002 while I was on the faculty. Um, spent 20 years on the faculty, going up through the ranks. Um, I had been funded by RCSA in many ways, served on a couple of their internal committees and boards. Um, and they found out that I was on the market for academic leadership positions. Um, so I, I had just finished a four-year stint as an associate dean at Wayne State, where I was most recently on the faculty, and um, was being headhunted and recruited by other institutions. And so I got a call from them that was, would you potentially be interested in doing this instead? And a month later, I was signing on the dotted line, and uh, three months later, I moved. Um, so it all happened relatively fast. One of the things it was, um, as I looked at the other program directors who I'd known very well, we're a small foundation. We're only 14 people. Uh, there are five of us with PhDs. The uh, At the time that I moved, the two other senior program directors had been on staff for 18 and 20 years, respectively. So my look at this was, if I ever want to do this, I should jump now because these positions might not open up again uh, in my career. And so uh, have not looked back, have really loved uh, the position. And um, yeah, so so it was, it was sort of a unique way to get the job in that it was a direct, sort of a direct hire. Uh, but, uh, but we do open uh, searches for, for positions when they're, when they're available. But it's also interesting, so first and foremost, you your relationship with the research corporation goes back decades because you had this fellowship. So that was already implanted in your mind, the significance of this. And you participated as a faculty member. Your career was as a faculty member. So this is the next generation. This is Andrew Five, the next generation of careers in the sense that you're in this next type of role. And it's so useful for all of us to remember that if you choose career X, you do not have to stay in career X. I mean, we saw that with Arpita, we saw that with Greg. So it's this is a really valuable lesson. Thank you for that. We're getting some great questions in. Keep throwing those in. We will address as many as we can get to. Um, we actually have one question that just came in. I wanna address this. This is a very interesting question. We got this question from somebody who wants to know, do remote jobs exist in science philanthropy? And how do you work around the limitations of foundations requirements to get 10 to 15% indirect rates to get projects off the ground. So who would who would like to, to address this question about remote jobs and the indirect rates, if you can? Really interesting question. So I can, the remote aspect, direct rates aspect, but I actually am a fairly remote worker. Um, and there actually are several on my, this task as well for the science team. Um, and that was something that it's very uh, it's foundation dependent, organization dependent as to the culture, as to what, are, what people are able to um, think about potentially doing. So this was a new thing for the Capital Foundation that uh, it was a few years ago that they decided to think about the aspects of potentially having remote workers. But what that meant was uh, negotiating how much time was remote and what that meant for coming to the office and for travel and things like that. So I go to the office in Los Angeles. It, it depends. It's either every month or it, it, one time it was twice a month or it's like every couple months. It kind of depends. And then there's lots of travel for conferences and meetings, as we already mentioned before, that going to those events and interacting with people is extremely important for staying on top of things. But one of the reasons why this works and why this works for myself and for some of my colleagues is because we actually talk a lot together online. And so we either have meetings or we just are in constant communication. And so we're able to have those those connections going and make them intentional. That actually allows us to be successful at what we're doing. And it's still kind of a work in progress for the foundation and addressing it, it's, it's evolving and figuring out how that works. But that's going to be very different for all the different science philanthropy organizations out there for their own individual cultures and what works for them. And it, it's going to be an, an individualized thing. And I suspect it also might depend on the individual job need, the time that the job becomes available and what the talent, uh, what the market of the talent uh, can provide. Quick question for you, Greg, just so I'm clear. So how would, if you had to guess in terms of the employees within the Cavalry Foundation, what percentage are remote or is it every, is everybody remote or almost everybody remote now? 
Uh, no, not not most everybody is remote. Um, uh, like I know, for example, that APS, for example, is a remote first remote first organization now, and so uh, they're they're primarily you know in that remote way. But we have several people that are remote. I would say it, if I could stick up the top of my head, it might be six or seven that are primarily remote. Some that come into the office more frequently, and some that come a little bit less frequently, depending on what's happening. We are a small organization. I forget the exact number. It's somewhere between twenty five to thirty people in the organization. So that also is probably what allows this to work in the sense that we can have a bit more of those connections. Um, that, that that we can keep each other connected. So a small amount of people is still kind of a large percentage just because of the, the, the fact that we're a small organization. But it's also useful to see the that we're seeing a little bit of a theme here, um, small but mighty teams, which means that you're able to spend more money supporting the science and the scientists as opposed to overhead for the employees, which is very interesting. Right. Arpa, uh, uh, within Schmidt Sciences, um, what's the, the policy for remote workers there? So we are hybrid. We're in the office three days a week. Um, so our founders really value in-person time for at least some of it. And um, and I'll say it's actually been nice post-pandemic to meet the people that I work with. At, when I was at Space Telescope, I spent the whole, whole time never meeting anybody. <laughs> um, so we... Um, yeah, we make it work. We like kind of get the quiet work done on the, the remote days and then try to fill in the meetings on the in-person days. Um, I'll also take a stab at the, the overhead question. Um, so I'll, I think what I'll say is I think most overheads are actually negotiable um, and we do negotiate those things to try and get uh, as much for our grantees as possible. So most of it goes to them, but then of course there's like infrastructure that universities need support for um, and so often we will, instead of having like a, a a black box overhead, we will have them break out the what constitutes the overhead so that we can actually support things that we agree that the project needs. That's excellent. And could you just give us a definition of overhead for those of for those of us in the audience who might not even be familiar with that word yet? What do you mean by that exactly? Okay, uh, this is not going to be a legal definition, but an <laughs> academic definition is, uh, so when you send money to a, a fellow or a group that you're funding, you usually have to send some percentage to the university to support that person that goes into longer term structural things like buildings and chairs and computers and uh, and often are quite disentangled in time from when the research is being done, but is part of sort of the like tax you pay to the university for housing the researcher and the work. Excellent. Thank you very much. Andrew, how about in Research Corporation of Science Advancement? Is there a remote? Is it hybrid? How do you, what is the culture there like? Oh, uh, so I would call us hybrid at this point. So like with ARPITA, our offices are physically open four days a week, though most people are only in the office three days a week. Um, that doesn't mean we don't work on Mondays and Fridays, but we do it from home. Um, we have a flexible policy. If I want to be distant telework, um, I can get permission to do so. So, uh, to work from California or Colorado or, uh, um, but there's the expectation that we're around. We do a lot of convenings. And so, um, those are held in Tucson for practical purposes and that it's easier to hold conf uh, these convenings near where our offices and staff are. Um, and so uh, the other thing to think about is that we do a fair amount of travel as Greg indicated. And so while I am physically located in Tucson, um, I'm I, I am either traveling or at our local convenings 30 to 40% of the time. So uh, um, yeah, we have office work, but uh, um, it's a, a less significant, sometimes a less significant portion of the job. Um, and then in terms of uh, indirect costs, um, yeah, I have a slightly different perspective than Arpita. Uh, this is the administrative cost of the University of managing a grant. And so uh, we, we, we cap ours, we're at uh, 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 10 to 15%, depending on the program. And uh, in terms of that, we're not going to enhance that because we're, we, we, we recognize that we need to pay the university for the grants team that manages the award, but we're not paying into other parts of the university infrastructure on small start seed grants. Um, we're not we're not paying for buildings and things like that. It's mostly grants. That's helpful to know. 
Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So we're getting so many great questions now. I want to shift this to get to as many of them as we can. We're getting a question. Um, this question is super interesting to me. What are the, your top tips for applying for and interviewing for jobs in philanthropy, um, particularly for those who are coming from an academic background and want to make the transition? But I would say even for, for other people related to that, that's the question, but related to that, what are the skills and experiences that if I'm applying for a job in philanthropy, I really want to make sure I'm highlighting. Uh, so who would like to start with that question? Such a great one to be able to answer. I'll go, I'll go ahead and bite. Um, Please. So I'd say the the ability to be broad and and far seeking uh, and and have that high longer term perspective on the science is super critical. Um, because my portfolio is not just in my area of expertise. You know, I may be reading a, an astronomy or dark matter proposal uh, uh, today and tomorrow I'm reading something on the gut brain axis. And so uh, building that breadth of experience um, is super important for our foundation where all of us are expected to have some level of breadth and be able to handle both convenings and proposals across that entire space. Uh, that doesn't mean I have primary responsibility for astrophysics. Uh, I have a colleague who has that experience, uh, but um, but we do have to have the wherewithal to go that full breadth. And then towards the the uh, other part of the question, I think get to know the foundation, uh, know what they're interested in, know what their culture is, um, uh, speak to people who have interacted or been employed by the foundation to to really get a sense of what their interests are. There is a huge difference between foundations. Uh, the Alliance now has 40-ish foundation members, and they vary from uh, very established that don't have family members who are engaged in the, like ourselves, and others like Schmidt, where Eric and Wendy are still very much involved. And the flavor of the foundation is dependent on whether it's board-driven or uh, family-driven uh, in that regard. And that helps. Very, very useful. Thank you very much. Arbetta, how about for you? What, what If I'm applying for a job, what skills and what experiences should I be highlighting? Um, and what are your top tips for applying for these types of roles? Yeah. So first I'll say, I think astronomers already have a very wide range of skills. So often you don't need to go out and get new skills. I think often you need to just reflect and recognize the skills that you do have. Um, so I think for me, a lot of what it comes down to is using, you know, the sum total of my experience doing different things in astronomy to make sort of quick assessments on whether something is good, if it has, you know, big flaws, uh, and then honing your instinct on what, you know, a, a lot of what we do is take risks uh, on ideas, right? This is one of those uh, flexibilities that Greg was mentioning. Um, and so there are there are risks that are worth taking and ones that are not. And so, you know, with minimum data, how do you go from this is a good idea, but it's not going to go anywhere versus like this is the path of the future. Um, so I think building that muscle and astronomers already do it. You know, you get you get called on to serve on panels and you uh, referee other people's papers. And so you, you kind of already do this uh, assessment. And so recognizing that that's a skill you have, I think, is is important. It's interesting, Arpita, that you mentioned that because the fact that astronomers, astrophysicists, you all have so many skills. I mean, it's really, it's almost mind boggling how many invaluable skills you have for many, many different types of career paths. But in my experience as a career coach for astronomers in particular, but also physicists, chemists, all sorts of different STEM fields, astronomers in particular, they tend to undervalue themselves and therefore under market, under sell, and also under explore for careers. But as you just described, you're getting communication skills, scheduling, project management, event planning, business skills, leadership, team building, communications. You're getting all of these skills just from being in astronomy, from just doing astronomy. And you want to make sure that you highlight those when you're applying, because to be honest with you, and if I can tell you a secret, your competitors are not going to know or realize that they should or could talk about those other skills. They're only going to talk about their science skills. And when you talk about both your science and all of the skills you got from being a scientist, you give yourself an advantage 
in the job application and job getting process. So thank you very much for that, Art. But Greg, did you have some thoughts about top tips and skills and experiences that you encourage people to really lean into and leverage when they're applying for roles? Yeah, I mean, I, I think everything that, that Andrew and Alberta have mentioned and, and that you also just expanded upon um, are, are wonderful and great, and those should absolutely be included. And I'll just add a couple more things to that. And that is, you know, being able to show that you can see the big picture, the broad picture of astronomy and astrophysics. You know, as Andrew was kind of mentioning, that, big, that building up that breadth of experience that you might have, but also being able to see kind of the, the bigger landscapes that you might be able to know the different parts of astronomy and astrophysics and be able to address those different things, but then also have a willingness to be able to talk to others about those parts that you might yourself not be quite an expert in, but then be able to learn or bounce ideas off of or ask, hey, what about this? And that being able to have that kind of openness, which, you know, when you're collaborating as a, as a scientist, you're definitely doing that sort of thing. So that's, again, one of those skills that you're already developing. Um, being able to do that and also building up the 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 connections of people that you have in different parts of the field to be able to reach out to them and talk to them about those different areas. That's an extremely important thing, especially as I was talking about before for how we're exploring different things, is that you need to be able to talk to people uh, throughout the community in, in the different aspects. So being able to show how your interactions with those people, the conversations, the fact that you are interacting and, and that you're willing to have those sorts of conversations um, and engagement, I think is really important as well. This is very helpful. So we've heard a little bit about how we can leverage uh, a career, career number one, career number two in academia and in being a researcher in policy um, into a career in philanthropy. But we're getting a couple of questions from people who want to know what types of opportunities are there available for me if I'm early in my career? Maybe I'm finishing on my PhD and I want to pursue a career in science philanthropy or I'm in my postdoc one or postdoc two and I realize you know what, being an academic or research scientist in my discipline is not exactly aligned with who I am, but being in science philanthropy could be. Are there opportunities for early career folks to engage in this community? So the Science Philanthropy Alliance does have a science fellows program, um, which is a career transition um most of the folks who have been science fellows, they get placed with a, one of the philanthropy, philanthropic foundations. Um, I know Kavli, um has had them. I don't know if Schmidt has, um, but there are a number, uh, the Dana Foundation has. Um, so there are a number of these out there and uh, it's that's the wrong link. That's not the RCSA fellows. That's something different. Um, this is the, uh, the it's called the Science Fellows Program. Um, and uh, it's open to early career scientists straight from the PhD or from a postdoc. And within the Science Philanthropy Alliance. Now, that is a brilliant idea. And whoever came up with that, I'd like to give them a cupcake because how amazing is it that they actually create an opportunity for mentorship and it's truly an on-ramp into the career space of science philanthropy. So that's really wonderful. I hope you will all consider taking advantage of that. Uh, Greg, Arpita, did you have any more, did you have other thoughts about um, how early career folks can find the on-ramp into your foundations? Yeah, I'll jump in. So uh, we actually have two positions open uh, at the moment for early earlier career folks. Uh, so I'm looking for PhD plus two years. That's not very strict. So, you know, if you have one year, eight months, you can still apply. Um, and so we, I'll, I'll say there's a lot of questions about how to have a position in philanthropy and there's quite a few philanthropies, but most tend to be small. So I'll say also that they are rare, but they're not so rare that, you know, you can't keep an eye out and find them. Um, so we, um, we tend to have this tier of uh, kind of postdoc level or uh early uh, like assistant professor level science associates uh, and we're hiring for two of those in astrophysics at the moment uh, I'm looking kind of for instrumentation strengths and or data analysis um, and we also probably will have more senior positions available so I'll say it's not that there are only senior positions there are certainly also early early career positions it sounds like for, for just like within this sector, uh, as is the case with so many other sectors, the earlier you get started by networking, by building win-win relationships with people, 
the more your ideas, your background, your passion, your talent, your intelligence, and, and your brand, your promise of value becomes solidified in the foundation representative so that when there is an opportunity, they think of you. And when you need an opportunity or want, you already have an ally within the borders of that foundation and within the community. With that, Greg, what's your thought on that? Is that kind of like how you think about it? Even so, an early career folk, <laughs> an early career folk could actually start now, even if they don't get a job immediately, they lay the groundwork now so that in the future they would potentially have an on ramp. I, I completely agree. And I would say that there's a couple of different ways to that I can think of right now to be doing that. One is that if, you know, if, if you're in grad school and you, your PI gets an award from a foundation, you know, you can talk to them about how they do that or someone else in your department or someone else that you know. Talk to them about how they went about getting that award and what they know about the foundation and how their interactions are so you can learn more about that space. As Andrew kind of already mentioned, each foundation is different. And that's one th one surprising thing that I've found, you know, from working in this space is that every foundation has a different mission. Every foundation is a different culture. Every foundation has a different way of doing things. And so it, it, each one will give you a different piece of the bigger philanthropy puzzle, basically. So that's one thing you can do right now in, in if you're a grad student, for example, in that. Another thing is that going to things like the AAS meetings. There often are people that are involved with careers that are there that you can talk with to get more information about different things, including job openings. As uh, Diane had mentioned in the beginning, there's a AAS careers page where you can go to look to see what listings are there. But then also the AAS meetings, sometimes there are panels that are specifically centered on careers. So, um, ARPADA actually led a panel, uh, led a session about Schmidt Sciences activities in astrophysics at the last AAS meeting. And so there, we're walking around at these meetings too. And so you can actually try to find us, you can ask who might be around, that sort of thing, and start having conversations that you get to know more of us and more of the space. That's a really great point. And I'm so glad you pointed out that ARPA had spoken. You actually gave a couple of talks at the most recent winter meeting, if I recall correctly. Were they on career development or was it on, what were you speaking on? Uh, so I was on one panel that was about international students in astronomy. That was really interesting. That was set up by the uh, Bacall Fellow at the AAS. So I think this this is we're trying to make that into a committee eventually. I think it has to become a working group first um, to support uh, really the large population of international students that make uh, and researchers that make up the workforce uh, of astronomy, even for the AAS. Um, and then the other one was a, a Schmidt Futures focus session where we were highlighting the projects that we're supporting now and sort of talking about this future, which we're still figuring out, uh, which is that we're starting at this, you know, uh, platforms that uh, support software and hardware, but where do we go from here? Um, kind of posing this question to the community in the anticipation that we'll engage with them more uh, in the coming years. So the point is, is that you all are where we are. In other words, you're at the conferences, you're you're in the, the communities, you're in the spaces and the times that we're occupying. And so ARPADA, if I was interested in science philanthropy and I was at the AAS meeting, like it would be really smart if I attended your talk and then went up to you afterwards and introduced myself and said, I'm you know finishing on my postdoc at the University of Arizona and I'd love to learn a little bit more about science careers in philanthropy. But if I went and did that and said, can we have coffee? Would you be okay with that at the meeting? Yeah, Not me personally. Course. I mean, maybe me too. Uh, and I'll <laughs> say, Greg and I met in person at the AAS also. We had a little philanthropy lunch. Uh, and so if you had come up to me, you probably would have met Greg and a few others as well. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. So the networks continue. So some people were asking how you find out about these opportunities and connect with people in these foundations. Watch your community see who is speaking. And when you see next to their name that they're speaking from the Kavli Foundation or Schmidt Sciences or RCSA or X and Y and Z Foundation, go to those sessions and then introduce yourself because you never know where that can lead. Uh, Andrew, did you have any other uh, thoughts that you wanted to share about this no, particular? I think no, the net networking and, and getting to know people in the foundations you're interested in potentially seeking employment at is super important. Network, network, network. Absolutely. Um, we are getting close to the end and I wanna make sure that everybody who wants that resume template is able to get it. So I'm gonna show you a slide really quickly and you can go to this website, talk.ac slash Elena G. Levine. You can either 
take your phone out, pick picture of that QR code or go to talk.ac slash Elena G. Levine, enter code foundation. We're going to ask you a few questions so we can get feedback and see, see what we can do to serve you with additional webinars on career related topics. But then we're also going to be able to instantly send you that resume template so you can use that for career planning purposes. Um, what about connecting on LinkedIn? Is that okay? Is that you, we've been putting our LinkedIn in here. If I connect with you, if I'm a, a, an astronomer, an astrophysicist, and I connect with you, should I customize my invitation? Should I then reach out immediately with a DM? What are your preferences typically when people connect on LinkedIn? I know for me, I am fine. It used to be that we would always customize the invitation. I think it certainly is appropriate if you are early career and you want to connect with somebody to learn about that sector, that organization, that career path, to say, you know, dear Dr. Roy, my name is Elena Levine. I'm doing my PhD in astronomy at the University of Arizona with an expertise in gamma ray bursts. And I see you're with Schmidt Sciences. I'd love to learn a little bit more about this career path. Would you be open to an informal conversation? Arpita, Greg, Andrew, would that be okay with you if I did that, or is that overstepping? What What are the What's your preference in terms of appropriateness in reaching out? I don't think you need the LinkedIn for that. You can simply con reach out and contact me or uh, any of my colleagues and and ask, uh, "Can I have an informational call?" And we would almost certainly give that to you. Uh, um, you know, that's part of what we do about being part of our communities. The LinkedIn actually is more probably useful in terms of seeing posts about what what our activities are, what we're doing, uh, when we have job opportunities or amplify the job opportunities of our partner foundations, uh, um, far more than just the ability to to DM me. At, uh, you know the um, you my my phone number is available. My my email is available online. So you, I'm I'm not I'm not hiding. <laughs> I find that many people who work for foundations are very open to people having these exploratory conversations because you found your jobs in unusual ways and you want to pay it back and pay it forward. Would that be fair to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We are, just, please. Sorry, I was going to say my email is a little bit harder to find, uh, kind of on purpose, but um, but you can get in touch on LinkedIn and my my Gmail is on there. Um, and I think always, always happy to to talk to people and kind of provide career advice, um, usually not looking for science pitches on LinkedIn, which I also do get sent sometimes, uh, but uh, always ha happy to happy to talk to people. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, oh, and I'll add, uh, yeah, I'll add that for the LinkedIn aspect, because also my email is harder to find on online as well, like like Arvita had mentioned. And but finding me on LinkedIn, it, I do appreciate that individualization, that customization, because if I just get an invitation, like, do I know this person already? <laughs> like, what is going on? Why, et cetera? And I try to do this slew thing to try to figure out who this person is. Whereas if you just say, hey, I would like to, you know, have a time to chat because I'm interested in, in talking about, you know, careers, et cetera, et cetera, then I'm much more open to that. Like, oh, okay. Yes, this makes sense. That's that's great. Yeah. So all of you today, you saw these fabulous, talented professionals on this webinar. You can say in the customization as you connect with them on LinkedIn, saw you speak, loved it. Thank you so much. We are almost at the end of our session, and I want to give our amazing panel one last chance to give us what is your top number one piece of advice for pursuing a career in science philanthropy, for landing the job, for building a joyous experience in this career space. And Andrew, why don't we start with you, please? What's your number one tip for us to walk away from today? Uh Bring your authentic self to that uh, conversation because we're looking for people who are really trying to share our passion for supporting science and let that show. And that's uh, often what we're looking for. So alignment, right? You're looking for the alignment of me with you, with the culture to make sure that I would be my best creative self should I work for the Research Corporation for Science Advancement. Thank you, Andrew. Greg, what's your final piece of advice, please? So I'm going to say something I said before, that if you're looking to get some experience in this area, then I really encourage you to look at the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship Program. I'll mention also that my colleague, 
Stephanie Albin, who's the science program officer for neuroscience at the foundation, also did this fellowship. She actually started, we overlapped very, very slightly, by like a couple months or something like that. So it's extremely positive program. It's a great springboard into a whole different arrays of different careers. You might find something you didn't know you liked. And there are related adjacent other types of science policy fellowships that scientists can pursue. In fact, the American Astronomical Soci Society has its own science policy opportunity too. So I'm so glad you you uh, shared that. Arfana, last but not least, lay it on us. What's your number one tip? Okay, so I think my number one tip is to think big. I think uh, often when we're in academia, we kind of shut down parts of our brains because we think there uh, there is not the resources to support certain kinds of ideas. Um, but I think the, the biggest like freeing experience I've had in this new job is that I really think in a much more unconstrained way now. And and honestly, so can the people still in academia. So I'm, I'm trying to kind of unlock this part of everybody's brains again, because I think thinking starting unconstrained can help you see what you really want to do. And then you can figure out what how to leverage your resources, because it's it's often not a question of you know, the funding bucket should then dictate how you start thinking about a project. Um, and so I'm in a very privileged position where I get to, you know, kind of remove the resource question and think about the landscape. Uh, but I think that kind of thinking is very energizing for the field in general. Absolutely. And it's needed for both the field and for the support of the field. So, and who thinks bigger and better than astronomers and chemists? Uh, but you all have the ability to do this type of work. So Arpita, Greg, Andrew, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Can we get a huge round of applause for our amazing panel? It was so refreshing to hear from you and get your advice and your honest contributions. Really got my brain moving and thinking about what else we can do in building our unicorn career. I want to thank my amazing pal, Diane Frendick, the Director of Membership at the AAS. If you have any questions about joining AAS, please see Diane. She is amazing and her whole talented team can help you. And one final thought is, you know, as a member of the AAS, one of your many, many benefits is that you can book deeply discounted career consultations with me. And we put the link in the chat. We're going to throw it in there one more time for you. This is something you can take advantage of for, for private, confidential career consultation. So we can talk about whatever it is your issue is. Thank you all so much, Diane. Did you have some final thoughts, please? Uh, just one thing that our next uh, career webinar will be tentatively scheduled for the 19th of June. So see you then. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.